Hi everyone, Dylan from Eurospares here. Now I don't know about you, but when I think of Aston Martin, the first couple of things that come to mind are James Bond, DB5, 177, Valkyrie. And even in recent years, it's now a publicly traded company worth billions of dollars that's just about to field a full works Formula One team. The point I'm trying to make is it's a brand that screams prestige and success. So surely that's always been true of the brand itself, right? <laughs> well, no, is the honest answer to that question. The first century of Aston Martin was an unmitigated disaster, but it does make for a good story. And I think that by the end of it, you'll be as pleasantly shocked as I am that the brand still exists today at all. So this is where Aston Martin began. Just through that gate is Henneker Muse, which is where engineer Robert Bamford was working for marine engine builder Hess and Savory. Now, Hess and Savory briefly dabbled in automotive engineering, but when they decided not to continue, Robert Bamford took it over. He bought the place with his friend Lionel Martin, and in 1913, Bamford and Martin was born. Note, however, that it was not yet Aston Martin. Aston, they would borrow from the Aston Clinton Hill Climb a year later, which was a race where they'd been making a bit of a name for themselves. Now, initially, the business was actually just a car dealership selling other people's cars, for example, things like the Singer sports cars of the time. But quietly in the background, they were developing cars of their own, the first of which was the Coal Scuttle. Unfortunately, the First World War brought all of that to a halt. Both men joined the military, and when they came back from the war, they got back together, and they got themselves a new workshop. And that new workshop was here, just off Abingdon Road on what is now called Vantage Place. And behind those gates was where Aston Martin really, really started to amp up their production. But this was kind of at odds with Bamford's vision for the company. So in 1920, he left. And so begins the game of musical chairs that is Aston Martin. In comes Count Louis Borofsky. <laughs> now, I say Count because there is zero evidence that either he or his father, who gave himself the title, ever had any legitimate claim to it. <laughs> I mean, needless to say, he was a very, very interesting man and was actually the designer of the race car Chitty Bang Bang, which would go on to inspire Ian Fleming's Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, which I guess in some ways is kind of our first, admittedly quite abstract, link to James Bond. Zborowski invested heavily in Aston Martin to keep it going and actually commissioned the first two Aston Martins that would enter Grand Prix. But sadly, he was killed in an accident at Monza in 1924 behind the wheel of a Mercedes. By this point, despite their racing successes, Aston Martin had only produced 60 cars. And in 1925, bankrupt. So around the time Aston first went bankrupt, two guys called William Renwick and Cesare Batelli had developed an engine that they'd planned on selling to other manufacturers. However, when they heard about the financial situation over Aston, they saw an opportunity. I mean, after all, that this was a brand that despite not selling a great deal of cars, was already building up quite a reputation in racing. So in 1926, they bought Aston as a means to jumpstart production of their own cars and moved to a new factory on this street, Victoria Road in Felton. Although because of all the development around here, there's not much left to see. Under their stewardship, Aston Martin built six to 700 cars, including the International, the Le Mans and the Ulster, as well as entering every Le Mans that ran between 1931 and 1939. But the 30s brought more financial trouble, with more investors having to step in and give the company more money to keep it alive. Namely, an investor called Sir Arthur Sutherland, who's the next of our Aston Martin Avengers. The Second World War hit, and the factory ended up focusing on producing parts for warplanes for the rest of the war. But they did sneakily manage to put together the Atom concept car, which clocked up over 100,000 miles during the course of the war, and would act as the kindling that would ignite the next chapter of Aston Martin. By 1946, the war was over, and Aston Martin was yet again up for sale. Although this time, it was up for sale in a tiny, tiny little advert in the classified section of the Times newspaper. Now, I haven't been able to find a copy of the actual advert itself. However, the text read, High-class motor business established 25 years, £30,000, net profit last year, £2.5 
£4,000. Industrialist David Brown would be the next torchbearer to carry on the flame of Aston Martin. He responded to the ad, drove the Atom, and was so impressed that he bought the business. And actually, at the same time, he bought the floundering Lagonda brand and combined the two to create Aston Martin Lagonda, with Lagonda being based in Newport Pagnell and Aston Martin remaining here in Felton. However, the original factory was completely destroyed during the war, so Brown relocated Aston Martin to a new facility just down the road, here at Hanworth Park Airfield. Every Aston from the two-litre sports cars until the DB Mark III would be built here. From the DB4 onwards, production moved to Newport Pagnell, with this facility acting as the service, engineering and racing headquarters until 1960. Now, to my mind, Aston Martin has David Brown to thank above most others for creating the prestige that the brand still enjoys to this day. Under his ownership, Aston Martin won the 1959 24 Hours of Le Mans, with their iconic DBR1 being driven by Carroll Shelby. He also founded the relationship with Zagato, which led to such cars as the DB4 GT Zagato and a host of other incredible cars, which we'll come back to very shortly. And the brand also turned out arguably its most recognisable car in the form of the DB5, which was first seen driven by James Bond in 1964's Goldfinger. All of this under the charge of David Brown. And that is why the DB model designation that Aston Martin still carry to this day are his initials. He is Aston Martin. So anyway, in 1972, Aston Martin went bankrupt again. Brown paid off the company's debt and then genuinely sold the company for about 100 quid to an investment bank consortium. But even then, a global recession and difficulties developing a US compliant engine would mean that Aston Martin went bankrupt again in 1974. Yep, that is twice in two years. And that really would have been the end were it not for Alan Curtis and Peter Sprague the next men in line to resuscitate Aston Martin. So behind me is what was the Newport Pagnell factory and is now the Aston Martin Heritage Works Centre. The factory closed in December of 1974 following the bankruptcy and reopened again in September of 1975 with about 100 employees. And by January of 1976, the company held about 330 orders globally. Under the Sprague and Curtis ownership, Aston Martin introduced the V8 Vantage and Volante as well as the Lagonda Saloon and the Bulldog concept car. And while this is all enough to keep the brand alive, it wasn't enough to make it a world beater by any stretch of the imagination. And in 1981, it was sold to its latest owner, British petroleum magnate, Victor Gauntlet. Now Gauntlet was a straight shooter and he realized it would take some time for Aston Martin to go from the 30 units that they had sold in 1982 to a point where they were actually a serious and secure business. And part of that relied on developing a new generation of cars. Now, just as a little aside, there was quite a complicated restructuring of the business in 1984, but in very, very simple terms, Peter Levanos, the Greek shipping billionaire, became the majority shareholder, with Gauntlet remaining the driving force of the business as the chairman. He bought a stake in Zagato, reviving the relationship for the V8 Zagato, and crucially wrestled James Bond back from his Lotus affair and got him back into an Aston Martin, actually supplying his own V8 Volante for Timothy Dalton to bond around in, in the living daylights. By 1987, Aston's financial situation had improved to a point where it was not great, not terrible, but if it wanted to survive and to thrive in the long term, it needed quite serious outside investment. And that's where our next unlikely caretaker enters the fray, the Ford Motor Company. At the 1987 Mille Miglia revival, Gauntlet met Walter Hayes, who was the VP of Ford Europe, and the meeting clearly went very well because Ford ended up taking 75% ownership of Aston Martin. In 1988, the ancient V8 was finally retired and replaced with the new Virage and Vantage derivatives thereof, which personally, I think is a high point for Aston. I might not want to pay the bills to look after one, but I would love to own one. <laughs> now the upcoming DB7 was going to take some serious engineering firepower. So Hayes replaced Gauntlet as chairman in 1991 and by 1993, Ford owned Aston Martin outright and placed it within their premier automotive group, which included Jaguar, Land Rover, Volvo, and Lincoln. In 1994, they opened a new factory here at the Vantage Business Park in Bloxham, where they produced the DB7. And it was under Ford's ownership during DB7 production that Aston transitioned from old school coach building methods to more modern, automated, and industrial production methods resulting in 770 cars being built in 1995 alone. A far cry from the 30 cars in 1982. 
By 2003, Aston Martin as we know it was really starting to take shape. They built 6,000 DB7s, debuted the V8 Vantage concept, introduced the DB9, and they also opened their first purpose-built factory here at Gaydon on an old RAF V-Bomber airbase. Which is fitting, seeing as Aston have now used all three of the V-Bomber names for the Vulcan, Victor, and Valiant. Up until 2004, all Aston Martin engine production took place here at Newport Pagnell. After that, Aston Martin set up the Aston Martin engine plant at the Ford factory in Cologne, which allowed for up to 5,000 engines a year to be built in a style similar to AMG, where each technician built a singular engine in under 20 hours. In 2005, after about 40 years out of the game, Aston Martin returned to the racetrack with a new division called Aston Martin Racing, which was essentially actually just outsourcing a works race team to the legendary ProDrive. The product of this was the DBR9, which to my eye and ear will always be one of the greatest race cars of all time. By 2006, deliveries of the DB9 and Vantage were well underway, ushering in a new and exciting era for Aston Martin. However, an internal audit at Ford had recommended that they get rid of one of the brands within the Premier Automotive Group. And as, as, as clinically insane as it seems with hindsight, they kept Volvo, they kept Jaguar, they kept Land Rover, and they kept Lincoln, and they got rid of Aston Martin. <laughs> now, remember I mentioned ProDrive? Well, in 2007, a consortium led by ProDrive founder David Richards would buy Aston Martin for £475 million, with Richards becoming the chairman, and the next in a long, long line of people without whom the brand simply wouldn't exist today. In July of that year, the last of 13,000 cars rolled off the production line here at Newport Pagnell, with production then moving almost entirely to the Gaydon facility, bar a short-lived outsourcing of repeat production to a facility in Germany. Between 2007 and 2013, Aston Martin had added the Signet, DBS, 177, Rapide, Virage, and Vanquish to their lineup, as well as reigniting the historical relationship with Zagato to create the stunning V12 Zagato. But 2013 marked something of a step change for Aston Martin. David Richards left the business to focus on ProDrive and was replaced as CEO by ex-Nissan executive Andy Palmer, who despite being a very, very serious businessman, had a serious task on his hands. Aston Martin was a loss-making entity every year from 2010 to 2017, and Palmer knew it needed a serious shake-up. He was actually quoted as saying, In the first century, we went bankrupt seven times. The second century is about making sure that is not the case. So, what was his plan? Well, it largely consisted of turning Aston Martin into a lifestyle brand as well as refreshing the supercar lineup, which is kind of their bread and butter, and also introducing a crossover, which would obviously be the DBX. And all of this in order to appeal to a wider audience and increase sales. As part of this process, a partnership was negotiated with Mercedes, which saw AMG supplying both engines and electrical systems to Aston Martin in exchange for 5% equity and a seat on the board. In preparation for the next generation of cars, Aston Martin invested £20 million in a 10,000 metre squared expansion here at the Gaydon facility, as well as raising £200 million from their shareholders in order to fund the development of these upcoming models. From here, Palmer doubled down. 2015 saw the debut of the Vulcan and the DBX concept. 2016 saw the brand announce that they would be opening a factory exclusively for DBX production in Wales, as well as debuting the DB11 at the Geneva Motor Show, which was the first Aston Martin to feature parts from the Aston Martin-Mercedes partnership. Near enough immediately after the car was revealed, Aston had 1,400 orders on the books for the DB11. And I mean, this could only bode well. And in fact, 2017 saw a return to profit for the British powerhouse brand. Given the wave of success that Aston Martin was riding, now was the time to make a big move. And a big move they did make. In 2018, Aston Martin floated on the London Stock Exchange, ultimately achieving a valuation of 4.3 billion pounds. And while that figure was actually quite disappointing given their initial estimates, in the wider context of the history of Aston Martin, it's really nothing short of incredible. I mean, you know, let's, let's not forget, the brand was bought for £475 million in 2007. And just 11 years later, it was already worth nearly 10 times that amount. 
Andy Palmer's leadership and vision really cannot be understated here. And in fact, I would argue that he was the first person in the 105 years of the brand up until that point who had managed to secure any kind of existential security for Aston Martin. And he also greenlit the Valkyrie, which, I mean, by mine and pretty much everyone else's book, makes him okay. Palmer would remain CEO for the following two years, during which time the Welsh factory opened its doors and the DBXs produced there began to be delivered. However, he would step aside shortly after Lawrence Stroll's consortium, which obviously included Toto Wolff, would invest into the brand. As part of the investment, Stroll obviously rebranded his Racing Point Formula One team as AMR GP, and from 2026, there'll be a full works team being supplied by engines from Honda, who funnily enough actually supplied that very team with engines back when they were Jordan. So, what else does the future hold? Well, alongside the F1 team, from 2025, Aston Martin will be entering the Valkyrie in both WEC and IMSA, which means that both of those championships are shaping up to be seriously, seriously good, given all the cars that are now entering. And on the more commercial side, Aston Martin's positioning itself to make a fairly serious splash in the EV market. Mercedes have increased their shareholding from 5% to 20%, while also promising to supply Aston Martin with hybrid and EV powertrains. And similarly, Lucid in 2023 made a massive investment into Aston, whilst promising to supply them with EV powertrains and batteries. So keep your eyes peeled for a new EV Aston Martin sometime in 2026, and hopefully no more bankruptcies. <laughs> so that was the history of Aston Martin, and I really hope you enjoyed watching it. If you did, don't forget to give us a like, and if you want to see more content like this, you can subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss anything else we put out. In the meantime, you can watch some other stuff that we've put out before over, over here somewhere, and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much for watching.